And then David came back three weeks later and Cole was completely wheelchair bound. Couldn't eat, couldn't speak, couldn't walk, nothing. I love you, mummy. It was just, just wasn't cold. There was nothing behind his eyes. It was heartbreaking. And it was at that point I decided enough was enough, and I was going to get his up-to-date medical records in Flight Holland and try and find a doctor that would prescribe Betrelite because the UK wouldn't help me. In this week's Your Evolution episode, we interview a mum from East Kilbride who has fought long and hard to keep her wee boy safe and look after his health. Lisa Quarrow's youngest son Cole was diagnosed with severe epilepsy and he underwent brain surgery at the age of two. But despite this surgery, Cole's condition deteriorated in later years and Lisa feared that her wee boy wouldn't even live to see his seventh birthday. NHS medics said there was little more that they could do for Cole, but then another option emerged, medicinal cannabis oil. So Lisa, who previously worked as a policewoman, was faced with two options back then. Smuggle this illegal plant medicine into the country for her son, or risk him dying. And I'm sure you can guess which option Lisa picked. We're now going to dive into Cole's amazing story as part of our plant medicine healing series for this month. But before we dive into it, can you please support the channel by hitting the subscribe button below this video. This is Cole, a wee boy from East Kilbride who has uncontrollable, drug-resistant focal epilepsy. Cole could have 20 seizures a day, he'd suffer temporary paralysis and his condition deteriorated so badly that his mum Lisa thought he was going to die in hospital. Medics told Lisa that there was little more they could do for her son and dismissed her suggestions of treating his condition with bedrolite cannabis oil. This oil was illegal and unlicensed in the UK at the time, but Lisa thoroughly researched it. She spoke to experts and discovered that this plant medicine was very effective in treating other patients with severe epilepsy. Okay Lisa, thanks for speaking to us this week. Um, really interested to hear Cole's whole story. Can you talk us through it? Um, so Cole was first diagnosed with um, focal epilepsy when he was just three months old. Took his first seizure in my arms um, and straight away we got him to the hospital. He was, they initially thought he had a thing called West Syndrome and decided to do scans and put him on steroids quite quickly. Um, after the steroids were um, weaned out of his system, he had went from having infantile spasms to seizures and that's when they knew that it was focal epilepsy. Um, he tried numerous different medications, but unfortunately they didn't work. And they knew really quickly, they said it would only take about kind of four or five drugs before they knew that it was, um, that he was drug resistant. So we spent the first kind of year of his life trying different combinations of medicines. Um, and then the second year we prepped for surgery. Um, he was a candidate for brain surgery, which happened when he was just two and a half. Edinburgh sick kids, he had a um, lesionectomy on the left temporal lobe, um, just this area here, um, and they removed um, kind of two centimetre cubed area of his brain um, while it was on the operating table, um, and they'd removed the part they believed was what was causing the damage. Um, he took another seizure, so they removed it a wee bit more. And we thought because of that, that we'd got everything. There was still some damaged tissue surrounding the area which they removed, but it was too dangerous to take that away at the time. Um, so they, um, he came out of surgery 
was in Edinburgh Sick Kids for a week and then we got him home and he was seizure free for six months. Mm-hmm. We thought that was it. And then unfortunately after the six months they came back. Um, they were initially quite um, gradual. So we was only having like maybe one or two a month. And then by the following year they were back as usual, which was about kind of 10 to 15 seizures a month. And um, they would go away for a couple of days when you try new medicine and then really quickly they would come back. Um, so after that we just kind of spent our time trying to think of other combinations we could get for them. We tried to diet, everything like that, nothing worked. Because for me, we were warned about the um, risks of a second brain surgery. Um, and so when that came back up, we were, his father and I were both definitely mm-hmm. against it. Um, and then, oh, no, June 2018, um, cold seizures got really bad and he started having like almost 20 every day. Um, and he was not just having them through the night, which is when he mostly has seizures, he was having them during the day. It was really affecting him. Um, and up until this point, cold seizures were always through the night and they, affect, they affected his develop, uh, development, but they didn't affect him physically, so you wouldn't have known that there was anything wrong with him. Um, and then, and he was in mainstream school. Uh, he had a slight development delay of about a year, but we, we kind of managed it. Um, and then in June they got really bad, and then I had put a post out on social media. Um, I've always been really public, cool story. Um, so I put a post out on social media just saying that, did anyone know of anything that was uh, available? in any place in the world that could help uh, Cole because my background before Cole was I'd uh, fundraised for kids who needed um, treatment that wasn't available in the UK mm-hmm. um, and that was just when Dylan was, I think Dylan was eight months old when I started doing that um, and it was my cousin's daughter needed surgery in America and um, she needed to raise something ridiculous like 40,000 in six months to be able to get the surgery so for me that, that kind of stuck in my gut that I just couldn't think of anything worse than having a child that you knew there was something out there that would fix them but money was the reason you couldn't help them mm-hmm. so I did a lot of fundraising so when I took to social media I knew at that point that the NHS is wonderful here but we we don't have all the answers and there is other options available mm-hmm. um, in different places in the world so that was kind of what my post was aimed at anyway everybody came back saying cannabis but at that time I had been a police officer for 10 years um, and when I was a police officer my uh, kind of understanding of cannabis was quite kind of tunnel vision. I just assumed that everything that they said bad about it was all that it was, which was it caused psychosis, um, gave you mental health problems, made you withdrawing um, and there was quite a lot of young males that um, we'd taken to um, psychiatric hospitals with problems. and. It was always put down to cannabis abuse. Mm. Um, so initially, I, I just said no. I'm not having my wee boy on cannabis. And then, the more people that said it, um, the more I thought, right, there has to be something in this. Um, but initially, when I started researching it, I was looking to prove myself right to everyone else that kept saying it to me, my family members, my friends, strangers. You know. Because I got to the stage I was kind of running out of excuses as to why I didn't want to try cannabis because I didn't know anything about it. Um, so I thought, I'll get a bit of knowledge and research it. And then when people say to me, why are you not using cannabis? I can then go back and say, well, because this, that and the next thing. But the more I researched it, I couldn't find anything that was negative other than stuff that had been written by pharmaceutical companies that set to gain from it kept remaining banned. So I... Um, I dug more and more and then I started looking into parents groups that were using cannabis. Um, Two kind of major parents were um, uh, Alfie Dingley's mum, Hannah Deacon, and um, Sophia Gibson's parents in Northern Ireland. Both those children had been using cannabis at that point for, I think it was about a year. Um, They both had been using vegetal light oil and successfully um, both had uh, one NHS prescription so I thought, well, that's the route that I need for coal. Um, kind of thought it would be a lot easier than what it has been. Um, and 
as I was investigating for Cole, Cole took a turn for the worst in the October 2018. His seizures got so bad that he started suffering a thing called toy paralysis, which is like a um, stroke after every seizure. So initially he would um, he would have a seizure and then he would be unable to move, speak, um, even lift his head for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and it ended up that the longer it went on, it was hours and he couldn't go to school, he couldn't have his breakfast um, and it was becoming more and more difficult so How, how was it for you seeing that? That must have been terrifying yeah. It was, um, I phoned his um, specialist nurse in Glasgow in tears saying, you know, because I got a fright I thought he had a stroke and through the night it wasn't, I didn't notice it as much because he would have seizures and just go back to sleep so I didn't notice that he was paralysed it was only as they got worse and he started having them late into the morning um, and she'd said, you know, this, this is, is it's a thing that can happen, it's called toy paralysis, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I, I was just like, but why is this happening? Because he's now six and he's had seizures since he was three months old. And they kind of said, you know, epilepsy is a terrible thing and you can be okay one minute and you can be like in a, a paralysed state the next. It's, it's just one of these conditions that you can't tell what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when I decided that, you know, I was going to try cannabis oil. Um, I spoke to the hospital about it first and they said it was a lot of nonsense, that it was um, internet propaganda and that I was to stop my nonsense. So I kind of backed off a bit. Um, and, but I was, in, I was already part of these groups on Facebook and everybody was posting all this stuff more information and then there was talks by scientists and experts um, Mike Barnes and Professor uh, Purby were both um, speaking at an event in Edinburgh so I thought go there, did a lot of research and it just seemed the right route and my gut, I've always trusted my gut I and mean, when I haven't, it's led me down the wrong route so I thought right I'm just going for it but obviously with my police background I was really nervous. I didn't want social work involved in my kids' lives. I just wanted to do everything above board and the best I could. Um, so I contacted a hospital in Barcelona, um, a clinic called the Calapa Clinic, and um, had a consultation with a doctor there who specialises in cannabis medicine. Told him everything that Cole had been through, all the medicines that he'd already tried, the surgery, sent over his medical records, and he said, start on a product that's a CBD with its whole plant so it has THC in it but it's at the legal limit so you can buy it online and um, they're not allowed to sell the oils or tell you what ones to use but they can say these are five companies that I would trust so the first one I bought was called my CBD um, 10% I think it was I got it shipped over and started giving him it and within three days his toy paralysis had gone he was um, not having any um, paralysis after any seizures and then we increased the dose over the next couple of weeks and his seizures went down slightly but then it kind of plateaued and we didn't get any more seizure reduction his um, toy paralysis stayed away but he was still having um, you know probably kind of six or eight seizures every night so I knew that I was on the right track but for in my head I thought well, I just need to get the Vegalite because it's got a slightly higher THC. Now I've proved that this is what he needs. I'll just go back to the doctors and tell them and it'll be okay. It didn't work like that. They weren't really neither impressed nor unimpressed. They just kind of were like, well, we can't talk about cannabis medicine. We don't have any dealings with it. That was it. Um, At that time, Epidiolex was being trialled, which is the only CBD um, cannabis-based product that's um, in the UK that's now licensed but at the time it was unlicensed um, and it was only for um, kids that had either Dust syndrome or lennox gastric syndrome um, Cole has neither um, it was for kids that were not a candidate for brain surgery Cole was because um, uh, still to this day they would rather if brain surgery is an option give your child brain surgery before they will allow you to try a cannabis-based medicine. Even though there would be huge risks for that. Yeah, 
expense and risks. I mean, it's it, it, it doesn't make any sense in any way you look at it, but that's the rule. Lisa had been trying the first CBD product with limited success for Cole and then got the support of her local MSP and MP in pursuing other cannabis treatment options for her son. Shadow Health Secretary Monica Lennon also raised the matter in the Scottish Parliament and asked what the Scottish Government would do to help this six-year-old boy. Cole was then given a cannabis oil called Epidiolex which has been shown to be effective in reducing seizures in patients with epilepsy. It was still unlicensed in the UK at that time, but Cole was one of five children in Scotland who were given NHS access to try Epidiolex. Um, unfortunately, because the Epidiolex was, was delayed, he had three weeks where he had no CBD at all. And in those three weeks, his toy paralysis came back. So much so that on our way to collect the prescription for Epidiolex, co collapsed in the lifts at Glasgow Sick Kids and two nurses from A&E who were just starting a shift had to help me carry him into the hospital and he lay on a bed for an hour to recover from the seizure that he'd had because of this delay. So we got him started on the Epidiolex straight away and he just went from bad to worse. Um, he just went downhill and we, I kept going back to the doctors and saying, this isn't working, something's wrong. He kept saying increase the dose, get it time to kick in. Just he was just getting worse. Um, so much so that um, the boy's dad works offshore, and um, he had left the weekend just before we got Epidiolex, and um, Cole had been up playing about and had been um, doing clay pigeon shooting and stuff with his dad and being in the hot tub. And although he wasn't a hundred percent. And he was still struggling with toy paralysis. He was recovering and he was, you know. And then David came back three weeks later and Nicole was completely wheelchair bound. Couldn't eat, couldn't speak, couldn't walk, nothing. There was nothing behind his eyes, it was heartbreaking. Mm. And it was at that point I decided enough was enough and I was going to get his up-to-date medical records in Flight Holland and try and find a doctor that would prescribe Bedrolite because the UK wouldn't help me. And he was rushed into hospital on the 22nd, I think it was, of March, unresponsive. Um, and while we were in there, we tried a lumbar puncture, a CT scan, blood tests, urine tests, we've done extensive bloods, extensive urine because I think at that time they believed I was maybe giving Cole something that I shouldn't and they kept asking, nothing they did all sorts of scans and I kept saying it's the epidiolex, there's something in it that's not agreeing with them it's really affected them um, and the the consultant and, and specialist nurse that, that had, that had dealings with Cole since he was three months old came to me and said, no idea, never seen anything like it a child deteriorates so quickly in such a short space of time and we can't find anything in the test that's causing it. Um, we thought maybe he'd went into status. So they kind of said to me, what do you think? Which is not what you want to hear as a parent from your doctors um, of your child's child. Um, and I said, I want to put him back on home plan. And they said, look, we can't support that. And I said, well, as long as you know that that's what I'm planning to do so that the medicine that he's going to be getting on from you guys doesn't react to the stuff that I'm going to be giving him. So yeah, the hospital had basically said that if I continued on the route I was going, which was messing about with the CBD products, Cole could deteriorate and die. And that the only option that was available for Cole was brain surgery, a second surgery. And we had, I'd already went to see the surgery team and they told me that if Cole was a candidate, um, that he would have to initially go in and have a procedure done by a robot that would drill 16 holes in his skull. They would put um, 
electrodes deep into his brain. He would keep them there for 10 days and that would tell them how deep rooted and bad the damaged tissue in his brain was. And then after that, he would heal for about six to eight months. And if the electrodes had told a story that meant that he could have brain surgery, he would then have to be opened up again and have part of his brain removed. Um, at that time, there was no good outcome. It was all, yes, he could die, like any surgery. Um, because he was getting opened up twice in such a short space of time, there was a high risk of infection, mm-hmm. bleeding in the brain. Um, and they said that if Cole goes under, the chances of him coming out of surgery, um, the highest chance we had was he would be paralysed down one side and partially sighted, and that would be it forever. So the best, that was the best option we could have hoped for, and anything other than that was death. So for me... That, wait a minute, that was going to be the best case scenario? Yeah, yeah. But if I messed about with the CBD and cannabis, he could deteriorate and die. So I'd actually took a, a good friend of mine who's also my local counsellor, um, Monique McAdams, with me to that meeting because um, the, it, Cole's dad was offshore. So um, I asked her to come with me just because I wanted somebody that wasn't going to get upset and had dealt with a lot of things like that before. Um, but Monique's a friend of mine as well and she's been around Cole his whole life. So for her to hear that, she was in floods of tears when we came out and I think I was just numb. And she kept saying to me, did you, did you hear what they said? Like, do you understand? And I, I just said, um, that's not happening. Like, I'm just not allowing it. And then that's when I kind of thought, right, enough's enough. And um, we had, um, after the hospital had gave me the shock of saying that they didn't know what to do, I knew that there wasn't anything else. But I also knew that going over to Holland and getting a prescription meant that I had two choices. One was I had to take my boys with me and keep them there for as long as it took to get cold better um, and give them the oil there because it would only be legal if I got a prescription there if I stayed in Holland. But if I wasn't staying in Holland and I had to then come back, I didn't have an importer's licence, so it meant that I'd have to smuggle the drugs illegally. Um, But with Cole being in hospital and he'd been unresponsive, he'd almost died, there wasn't anything else I could do. It was just a case of I either do it or I let him die and I thought right I'm just going to take the chance. I probably naively thought that once I got him better and I proved that I was right as well as all these other parents that had already been doing it that they, they would understand and they would be like well done that's amazing let's kind of look into this more. Um, obviously that didn't happen and what happened was I went to Holland with his medical records Stayed there for four days, seen three or four different doctors until eventually one doctor agreed. Um, in fact, he was quite shocked that Cole hadn't already had um, tried the, the cannabis oil and he prescribed Vedralite, which was what I wanted. Um, got it and the next day I flew home, um, put it in my case and that was it. And got home and started him on it. And then the first day I gave him it, his seizures halved. And then after that, they have to gain. And then I had to stop it because they put more in a drug, that phenytone drug, which runs off your liver, and so does cannabis. So it meant that they could interact with each other. But thankfully, I had so much support from specialists in the cannabis community that, um, you know, professionals, that I would ask them. And they would say, right, well, when they're giving them loading doses of phenytone, don't give them his cannabis, give them 24 hours and then start it. So that's what we had to do. So for the first couple of weeks, it was a bit of kind of tweaking. And then by the 1st of April, now bear in mind he'd been rushed into hospital on the 22nd of March unresponsive, and by the 1st of April it was seizure free, no seizures. Um, we, we got out of hospital and they let us home just for the weekend. Um, and their dad, David, he's braver than me, so he had them overnight um, and phoned me the next day and said he had Domino's pizza last night. And two days before he was on a liquidised diet, so I was terrified. Mm-hmm. And he was just getting better and better. And then we were to take the take him back into hospital on the Monday. And he was going to stay in for a full week of intensive support, which was physio, speech and language. Um, we had to meet with the dietitians about what kind of level of liquidised diet he was going to be on. And we arrived at the hospital and 
there wasn't any beds and the consultant took us into a family room and it wasn't Cole's usual consultant, he was off on holiday and he said, he kept looking at the notes and then looking at Cole and then looking at the notes and he said, what, was he not in like, unresponsive like a couple of weeks ago and I said, uh-huh and he said and he was only home for the weekend and he was coming back in for this intensive therapy and I said, uh-huh and Cole got up and tried to walk across from one chair to the other when he hadn't walked um, and he was just like, I don't see the point of him staying in hospital, we don't have any beds, he's as well going home and recovering and he's clearly doing very well and we'll just get the intensive therapy to come out to the house. He was still not fully recovered but he was seizure free and that meant that if we could keep the seizures away his body could heal and recover. stronger and stronger and then his consultant who had said you know that was it for Cole and they had no idea how to help him and you, you know he could deteriorate and die had been on holiday he went to Florida and he was away for three weeks and before he left he just looked devastated because you know he's known Cole since he was a wee baby and he could I could see in his eyes he was devastated so when I got Cole better I thought I can't wait for him to see him but I didn't get that reaction. I just got a kind of, oh, well, Phenotone's done its job. Mm. And, and I was like, really? Like, I've read up on Phenotone and it's highly toxic. Um, you know, it causes gum disease, heart disease, liver disease. It causes rare forms of cancer. Um, it's horrific. It's a really bad drug. And you've got to have your liver function levels checked all the time to make sure they're not too high because it can go toxic in the body. And it can actually cause seizures if it's not at the right dose. So this consultant was in denial that it was the, the cannabis yeah. plant medicine that was working? Yeah. And I said, do you do you honestly believe that this is Phenotone? And I was really hurt because I was thinking, and he, he said, yeah, Phenotone, when it works, it's an amazing drug. And I was like, I don't doubt that for a second, but it's scientifically proven that CBD and cannabis have um, healing products in it, and Phenotone doesn't. So, like, okay, phenytoin might stop seizures, but would it heal somebody within a two-week period? Will it take someone from a wheelchair and have them run into their stool? Like, that surely is enough to make somebody go, well, wait a minute here, there has to be something in this. But they just refused to discuss it with me, they refused to have any conversation about it. Um, but they knew at that point what I was giving them, they knew I was giving them whole plant, plant cannabis because I had to be honest because I had been secretly filming with the BBC and the BBC had came to Holland with us and had seen us smuggling the drugs and I knew that the documentary was being aired at the beginning of June and I was going to be outed if you like as being a drug smuggler. I knew that there was a risk and, and um, the documentary was uh, by a, a, a lady called Sam Poland and, and at the interview she says to me, you know that this is going to go out and you're going to be outed and this could have serious consequences and at the time all I kept thinking was I just don't want my kids taken off me but surely now that I've, I've proved that Coles went from almost dying and, or to a life stuck in a wheelchair to being a wee boy and at, at the end of the documentary you'll see he's, he's climbing trees and he's running about and he's, he's laughing and speaking and singing 
And I was like, surely anyone that looks at that says, I'm not, I wasn't smuggling drugs by kilos. <laughs> I wasn't bringing it back to, to sell on. It was enough for my wee boy so that he had the chance of having a, a, the best quality of life that, that he could have. The documentary went live and I was front page news everywhere the next day. Ex-cop smuggles drugs. Um, and I had um, journalists waiting to catch me getting arrested, which I never, thankfully. Um, but two police officers did come to my door. Um, two detective sergeants came on a Friday um, to say that they were investigating me for child protection issues and if I didn't sign a mandate to allow them to contact Cole's um, school, his doctor, his GP, um, the consultant and at that time I'd managed to get a private prescription from London for the Vedralite oil which meant that at that point what I was doing was legal but I had admitted to doing it illegally first from March to May and then they said if you don't sign it we'll start child protection uh, procedure straight away. So I had nothing to hide, I signed it. But it is terrifying when you know that you're then becoming, you're writing to people who see your kid for a couple hours and say, is she a good enough mum? Um, so that went on from the June and it was Cole's birthday, 26th of July um, 2019 that I got the phone call finally to say that everything had been dropped. There was no case to answer. So uh, they weren't pursuing me criminally or um, for child protection issues and they agreed that, you know, what I'd done was out of the, good, the best for Cole, unfortunately. What, what do you think would have happened if you never got the bed really? I don't think Cole would have made it to his seventh birthday. I think that if he had, he would be in a wheelchair just now and there's nothing that I could have done because once that surgery is done, it's not... You can't reverse it. It, it, that's it. They would basically have separated the left side and the right side of his brain and he would have been living partially sighted and in a wheelchair for the rest of his days if he was still here. It obviously completely justifies what you've done and I'm sure every mother would support what you did. What's what's the situation now? Um, now we're kind of not really any further forward to be honest, um, unfortunately. I have, I went to Westminster um, when there was a campaign group in European and they were um, speaking to Matt Hancock, the health minister, about having this available in the NHS because the law was changed in November 2018 to allow products such as Vegelite to have more access for children such as coal and there's over, I think there's about 40 or 50 children that's, that's outspoken about it and there's probably hundreds more that are not and um, that are using Vegelite and having um, amazing improvements. Um, so they had all kind of uh, campaigned and went to Westminster to, with their MPs and I had flown down to London and um, met my MP um, and we kind of spoke to Matt Hancock and at the time there's video clips as well of him promising again that he would help and then after that day he never done anything. He said there was going to be put trials in place and nothing happened. Um, unfortunately, I had went all the way down there and Matt Hancock and my MP had said, you know, that they could help. Only when I came home, uh, I got uh, I got information from uh, the girl from End of Pain who had got it back from the Westminster government to say that we haven't been included. Even if there was trials or testing done, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be included because one, I'm in Scotland and two, I'm under a different NHS. So that infuriated me because I thought, you know, I just spent my own money flying down to London, spent, I flew down first thing in the morning, came home last thing at night because I still had a sick wee boy, um, to be told that it was a waste of time. So I then went back to the Scottish Government, but it was almost like, and it's still the same, it's like a hot piece of coal that nobody wants to hold on to, they just keep passing it about. Scottish Government say it's Westminster, or they blame the clinicians and they say, as um, politicians, we cannot force clinicians to prescribe this. And I go back and say, I'm not asking you to force a clinician to prescribe it, but I'm asking you to look at the guidelines that are hindering the clinicians to be able to prescribe it. Um, Cole's consultant has already tried to prescribe it. Cole's GP's already tried to prescribe it and it's been blocked. Um, his GP was blocked because of the, the BPNE and the NICE guidelines. Cole's consultant is bound by the BPNE guidelines 
Um, why? I have no idea because as far as I'm concerned, the BPNE are a self-appointed charity who have um, um, inappropriate connections with pharmaceutical companies, one of them being GW Pharmaceuticals, um, and that's already been discussed and apparently that's just what we do in the UK. It's okay for the people who write guidelines that restrict my son from getting the medicine that saved his life to also take payments from drugs companies to see whether their expert opinion is that they should be legalised in the UK. Um, and funnily enough, the only the BPNE, the only a drugs company that they've allowed to have full access to our market is GW Pharmaceuticals, who pays them for their expert opinion. And they can't see that that's corrupt. They think that that's, apparently that's just the way it is. Um, and I keep saying, why does a self-appointed charity with no legal standing in Scotland or the UK have such power over Cole's consultant that's known him since he was three months old? He's The very fact that he tried to prescribe and was told not to means that, to me, it should be prescribed because I've known and respect this man for, what, well, eight, so eight years, and um, he wouldn't have asked to prescribe that if he didn't believe that it was the best for Cole. Mm-hmm. He wouldn't have. So the fact that he's wanted to should be enough, um, and the barrier should be removed, especially because now Cole's been on it for two years next month, and uh, he's the best he's ever been. And we go through stops and starts, usually to do with the phenotone. Um, so when the phenotone levels get too high, it can cause seizures, and we then have to mess about with the phenotone and the, 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 the bedrolite. But I have to do that with the help from the NHS consultant for his uh, phenotone and his private consultant to do with the bedrolite and have to work out what's what, because nobody's owning all of Cole's prescription. Um, that's really frustrating. Um, so right now, the Scottish government are saying it's nothing to do with them. They've kind of stopped blaming Westminster because that argument's done, but they then just keep batting it back and forward. Clinicians say we can't prescribe because of the guidelines, and the Scottish government say we can't force clinicians to prescribe. The Health Minister and I have met now twice. The first time I sobbed my heart out in front of her, and she didn't even offer me a tissue, um, and said pretty much there was nothing she could do. And then the second time I met her was July 2019, when Cole was amazing. And I took him with me and met her. And she was with the G Pharmaceutical Officer. At that time it was um, Professor Rosemary Parr. And I sat in the meeting and I asked her to look at a video of Cole taking a seizure. And I said, this is what I need to watch 20 times a night. At Cole's worst, he was having 20 seizures every night and he was having breakthrough seizures during the day and he wasn't recovering. And I, and I said, have a look at that, and she refused to look. She didn't acknowledge Cole. He sat there, and she didn't even like, speak to him or you know, acknowledge him or be friendly towards him. It was very much, this is the, this is where we stand. So I uh, contacted Nicola Sturgeon Direct, and I've yet to hear a response from her. Then Cole's wee best friend, who is in a wheelchair, Lucy, um, went to one of the independence rallies in George Square um, last year and they were at George Square and she took Cole's story on a printed out bit of paper and had it on her wheelchair wheels and basically said to everybody help my best friend and asked Nicola Sturgeon to come and have tea with her and Cole. Um, Tea and cake with her and Cole so she could show the First Minister how amazing her best friend had and her best friend was no longer in a wheelchair anymore and we never got a reply. The papers have a story on it, never get an acknowledgement. Um, and it hurts because just there at Halloween, there was a wee girl dressed up as Nicola Sturgeon and she went and replied direct to her to say, oh, this is so funny. And I'm thinking, well, my wee boy's best friend, who's also got disabilities and learning difficulties, went out her way to try and ask you as your First Minister to help her best friend and she never even get an acknowledgement. Um, and it's, for me, it, it's just, it's sad because you know, I, I feel as if I've done everything I could, I've went and I've done everything the right way. I didn't go to any back street dealers, not that I'm saying there's anything bad about that, but as a parent, if I was a, an adult and it was for me, I might have took a different route. But as a parent, I've got to make sure I did everything above board so that social work don't come in and take my kids off me. I got a um, pharmaceutical grade product 
I got it from a doctor, it can only be prescribed in Holland and it can only be prescribed in the UK, it's not something you can buy over the, the market. Um, I pay over the odds because I know now and being in the, the cannabis community that somebody could make that for me tomorrow and it would be like a quarter of the price, if not less. I've had people offer me it for free. I can't do that because I need to keep my wee boy safe and this is the, the best way I can do it. So I've done everything. I've kept it right with the hospital. I've told all them what I was doing. Um, I owned up when I did stuff illegal and said I hold my hands up, but I can justify. And for me, it's all about justification. Um, I've proved beyond any doubt that this is the right thing for coal, whether it be with the ferritor or without, I don't know, because I wouldn't ever change anything just now because he's, he's doing so well. He was 18 months seizure free. Um, and you know, that's the first time he's ever been any longer than six months seizure free. Um, he's, you know, he's just, he's doing so well, but yet they won't, they won't hear of it. They won't help me. And it's just pass a parcel. I kind of gave up asking for it on an NHS prescription and thought, well, right now we're in the middle of a pandemic. I'm trying to make a thousand pounds every month to keep my wee boy safe because if the oil stopped tomorrow he would go into status and he would probably die and I would be back in hospital trying to find other solutions which there isn't any we've already established that and um, so I went back to them and said okay you are saying you need double blind trials even though cannabis doesn't work like that you need the, all these tests and stuff done even though you can't go to other countries in the world that have already proven this over and over again um, while you are sorting that out, the political side of it, while you're doing the testing to find out what I already know, can you then at least put a fund in place for, for Cole and other children in his position to make sure that as a parent, Cole's safe and he's got the products there every month and I was told absolutely not because um, it would be misuse of NHS funds for the health minister to pay for a private prescription. They said to me it was your choice, I've got it in black and white, it was my choice to go to um, the NHS, uh, to, to go private to get coal that oil and therefore I have to now pay for it every month. And I said it wasn't a choice, the, the, the choice for me was life or death for my wee boy and the, the, I chose life and I got him the oil and now I'm left paying a thousand pound every month to keep him safe because the NHS couldn't. It wasn't that I chose a different route. Mm. It's just they couldn't, so I found out a way that I could. Um, and I'm not looking for some big celebration or a pat on the back, I'm just looking for them to agree and go, do you know what, you did the right thing, you're right, well done, Cole's, here you go, there's a prescription for your wee boy, that's it. Um, and the only um, medical person that's ever done that was the private consultant, who is a um, neurologist, a paediatric neurologist, and, and they said, you know, you've made the right choice and that's incredible. Um, they actually cried when they seen the videos of from what Cole had been to what he is now and he was there at the meeting so that was a massive thing for me was having a medical professional finally saying you done the right thing. Mm. Words he just wants to say. Yeah. 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 Thank you for the hospital for saving me. Yeah.